Our tour begins in a meadow filled with flowers. We are in the midst of a great and recurring community of life, for all things here are, in one way or another, joined to all other things. And all things repeat with their own incessant rhythms. Witness the flowers and the bees. The first flowering plants, unshowy and plain, were pollinated by a primitive sort of beetle, and to this day, a variety of insects, beetles, ants, butterflies, and bumblebees help pollinate plants. But honeybees are the most specialized, co-evolving with the flowers more than a hundred million years ago. Flower and bee, both took and gave, changed form and living patterns to suit one another. The honeybee you see here is a female, a worker bee, gathering nectar and pollen. She'll take the nectar back to her hive to be turned into honey by her sister worker bees, to store and use as food during times when no flowers are in bloom. Most of the pollen will go back to be fed to the young bees, but some will brush off and fertilize the next flower she visits. This bee is trim and neat and delicate, and she is banded with yellow, which means she belongs to the Italian race of honeybees. Other races of the European honeybee all belonging to the species Apis mellifera are colored differently. Apis mellifera is just one of the 3,300 species of bees that may be found in North America. We can see her even more closely as we use a scanning electron microscope. The effects of evolutionary adaptation, bee body structures so specialized as to be highly suited to making a living from flowering plants, and in turn ideally formed for spreading pollen from flower to flower. These structures, so delicate, so precise, so suited to their function, become, when enlarged, pure natural form, as beautiful as flowers. As we move around the bee, we can see that she has certain things in common with other insects. She has an external skeleton which requires growth through metamorphosis. She has a segmented body, six legs, and sensory antennae. Along with her cousins, the wasps, she has two pairs of delicate, membranous wings. Unlike most wasps, however, she is hairy, which makes her good at transferring pollen from one plant to another as the granules become tangled in those hairs. As we come to the bee's face, we can see two bulges on either side of her head. They are her compound eyes. But when we increase the magnification, we can see that they too are hairy. These hairs are sense receptors, and they tell her about flight speed and wind direction. At still higher magnification, her eye looks bumpy. Each bump is an independent, image-receiving facet and altogether those facets make a compound eye better than our own for detecting polarized light and for seeing flowers waving in the wind even though compared to us she is myopic and receives fuzzy images of even large nearby objects. In between her two compound eyes the bee has three additional eyes one of which we can see tucked in a forest of branched body hairs These eyes sense light and may tell her when to begin flying and when to go home to her hive. They may also help her measure horizon and ground so that she can stay level in flight. At even higher magnification, we can begin to see the details of her hard chitinous exoskeleton. We are now near the center of her head. Our tour continues across the bee's face. We come to the base of her antennae, which are important if incompletely understood sense receptors. We think that they give the bee information about odors and vibrations, but they probably also tell her things that we humans, with different sense organs at all. As we move down the front of the bee's face, her mouth comes into view. 
When she feeds on a flower, she closes those long open parts at the base of it to form a tube and pumps with her tongue to draw up the nectar from the flower. And as she feeds, her body will become coated with granules of pollen. These pollen grains are a high protein food, which is the reason pollen is gathered for young and developing bees to build their body structures. Adult bees are carbohydrate feeders. We are moving past her front feet towards her rear leg. One of her pollen baskets is now visible. The pollen grains trapped between the hairs which form the basket contain the male genetic information of the flower that produced them. At higher magnification, a butterfly scale is revealed, resting among the grains of pollen. We are now passing along the pollen basket and out towards the end of her leg. The stiff hairs lie in rows. The joints between leg segments are hinged, with motion limited to one plane. No part of her leg has anything like the freedom of movement our leg is capable of. At the end of her leg is a claw-like comb, which she uses to pack her pollen baskets. She combs with her right leg to pack the left, and with her left leg to pack the right. This is her stinger. She will use it only for defending herself or protecting her hive. Powered by pulsing muscles, she will drive the stinger with its venom into the flesh of an intruder. The sharp barbs will hold it in place. Once used, she will die. Circling past the rear of the bee, we begin to move along her right side, past her legs and towards her wings, delicate membranes which give her the power of flight. Flat, thin wings strengthened by veins and covered with short hairs. Our bee is young and fresh with wings intact, but during the summer months, when she will be flying all day long, she will wear them out as pieces of these fragile structures break off. By the end of her lifespan, six weeks or so, she will be left with mere nubbins of wings. Soon our tour will come to an end and we can release her to fly back to her hive and join her 60,000 sisters in their interrelated tasks of making honey storing pollen, raising young bees, and defending their colony. In her hive, a single queen reigns, mother to all the bees there. The complex structure of the colony and the work it does assures that there will be more flowers. And the flowers, in turn, assure that there will be more bees. <laughs>